several years. I don't I don't remember uh, when I first started coming, but it's been several years back, and uh, it is my privilege to be with you once uh, again. And uh, I love you folks, and I love your pastor, so Brother Daniel, it's a privilege for me to preach in your pulpit, so thanks for asking and inviting me to come. And I'm glad to see my brother here tonight. Amen. Uh, it's my Good. brother Jeremy and his pastor, Brother Mike. I'm meeting Brother Mike for the first time uh, tonight. And Amen. my brother and I get to see each other uh, once or maybe twice a year. So a special treat for me. Amen. You get to see uh, him and his pastor tonight. Sure. Uh, they're from Fayette County, Tennessee. And so I came about an hour and 10 minutes to get here tonight, and they came about an hour and 10 minutes uh, to get here tonight. Amen. And uh, so I don't know how far the rest of you came, but thank you for coming and being yes, in the sir. services. So let's take our Bible and open, if you would, please, to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 30. Mm. <laughs> and I'll be preaching these three nights from the book of Proverbs, chapter number 30. Mm. There is a set of verses in the chapter that I'll be giving the exposition from over these three nights. But before I read this set of verses from which I will preach, I would like to say something about the chapter in which our verses are found. And I'll say these things about the chapter, hopefully just to pique your interest in our study of one section in the chapter. First of all, I want to say about Proverbs chapter number 30 that there is something mystical to this chapter. Mm -hmm. Something mystical. Look at how it begins in verse number 1. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 1, it tells us that the words of Augur, the son of Jakey, even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Ucal. There is something mystical about this proverb and yeah. that we know in the beginning of the book of Proverbs, we are told that these proverbs are the proverbs of Solomon. And that Solomon has not only written this book, but that it is Solomon himself who has composed these right. proverbs. When you get to the last two chapters of the book of Proverbs, you come to something interesting. <laughs> yes, sir. And that is that our chapter 30, which is the next of the last chapter, we are told that Augur is the writer of uh, this chapter. And then, of course, in chapter number 31, we are told that it is the words of King Lemuel. We are not sure what to do. This is somewhat mystical. Both of these chapters, including our chapter 30, something mystical here. And that we're not exactly sure what to do with the names that are ascribed to the chapters, Augur and Lemuel. Some believe that Augur and Lemuel are just pen names of Solomon. That these are pseudonyms that Solomon is using in which he is writing these chapters as he has the others, but in these last two, somewhat in disguise, disguising his identity. And that may be true about Lemuel in chapter number 31, because Lemuel is identified as the king, and it could have been some other king other than Solomon, some king that Solomon was friends with. But uh, certainly I could see in chapter 31 that Lemuel might be a pseudonym for Solomon. But in chapter 30, when it comes to Augur, it tells us his father's name was Jakey. And uh, that does not uh, resemble the name David in any way, form, or fashion. And we know that David was Solomon's father. So if Solomon is the writer and he is using this pseudonym and pen name of Augur for himself, he is using a pseudonym and a pen name for his father David, referring to him as Jakey, and then referring to these two other gentlemen in verse number one to whom he is speaking that we know absolutely nothing about. Right. 
right. So here's the mystical thing about chapter 30. We don't really know anything about Hawker. We don't know anything <laughs> about Jakey. Yeah. We don't know anything about these uh, uh, FIL and UCAL. These right. are mysteries making this chapter somewhat mystical in that we're not sure who it is that is writing or the gentleman, the two gentlemen to whom he is writing and or addressing. I am of the persuasion that this is probably not Solomon in chapter number 30. That doesn't mean that the book of Proverbs are not a collection that uh, Solomon has put together. Most likely Augur would have been a close friend to Solomon and Augur submitted this proverb under inspiration of the Holy Ghost to Solomon right. and he included it here in his collection of proverbs making up this book. But irregardless of what uh, interpretation you take of this first <laughs> verse, there is something mystical going on here. I want to say secondly about this chapter before we get to our key verses. I want to say that in the chapter we not only see something mystical, but also we see something prophetical. Mm. He tells us in the first verse, and this is unusual, that what he is writing, what Augur is writing in this chapter is a prophecy. It is a prophecy. You typically don't find prophecy in Proverbs. Those are two different <laughs> genres of writing and writing style, but we have it here that what he is writing is a prophecy. Hmm. And I'm going to tell you from reading this chapter and studying this chapter, I find it uh, difficult to trace exactly where the prophecy is at <laughs> in the chapter. But I know that there is prophecy here because writing under inspiration yeah. of the Holy Ghost, he said it's prophecy. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. chapter in that it is mystical as to its penmanship and it is certainly mystical, not only in its penmanship, but in prophecy. So it's mystical and it is prophetical. There's something interesting, another thing interesting to me about this chapter, and that is not just that it is mystical and prophetical, but because it is theological. Look at verse 4. Mm. Verse number 4 is one of the most theologically mm. astounding <laughs> verses in all of the Old Testament. It is clear in verse number 4 that Augur is talking about God. He is giving us some theology. Yes. And I want you to notice he's saying some interesting things about God. Verse number 4, Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? Notice this next question. And what is his son's name if thou canst tell? Mm. This is obviously a reference to God. He is describing things in verse 4 that can only be true about God, the God of the Bible. Right. And he asked the question of the God of the Bible, what is his name? And watch this now. What is his son's name? <laughs> yeah. There's some that will tell you that the idea of the plurality of persons in the Godhead, or what we call the Trinity, is a purely New Testament concept, nowhere yeah. to be found in the Old Testament scriptures. I beg to differ with right. that in many places sure. of the Old Testament, but this is one of those places in which the writer of this proverb and prophecy, Augur, believes that God is a father and that God is a son. Yes. And that God the Father has God the Son. And he believes that there are at least two people who are God. Right. Believing that there is only one God and not more than one God, but more than one who is God. Right. Amen. This chapter is mystical, it is prophetical, and it is theological. But listen to me, this chapter is symbolical. Mm. One of the interesting things in reading the chapter is that Augur is using a lot of symbolism, some of which we're going to look at in these three services. But all through the chapter, there is symbolic language where Augur is comparing one thing to another thing. 
almost as if this chapter is a parable as much as it is a proverb and a prophecy. You know, the word parable in the New Testament, the parables that Jesus told, that word parable means to take something from the natural world and lay it down beside something in the spiritual world, to take something, to pick something up that you do know and lay it down beside something that you don't know so that by what you do know, you can learn some things about what you don't know. That's what Augur is doing through the whole chapter. He's speaking symbolically and talking about some simple things that we do know to explain some things that we don't know. How about that? All right, now we're about to read our text. Don't be nervous. But leading into our reading of our text tonight, I want you to understand the chapter is not just mystical, prophetical, theological, and symbolical. It is numerical. This chapter is numerical. It contains six sets of four things. Let me say that again. It contains six sets of four things. Over and over in this chapter, you will find Augur saying something like this. There are four things, and then he will describe the four things. You'll see this six different times. There are six sets of this. Or he will say there are three things, and then one more. Or there are three things, and then a four. There are six sets of these. All right, so you'll see 24 of these things that are very symbolic in the chapter where he's, taking, where he's taking something we do know, something in the natural realm, laying it beside the spiritual, and he does it in sets of four, six sets of four. I think in threes, all of my sermons have three points. No poems at the end, just three points. Right. I just think in threes. That's how my brain works, all right? People ask me as I go around preaching across the country, they say, you know, we've heard you preach a lot of times. You always have three points. Why do you always use three points? It says there's always three, but there's never anything but three points. I said, it's real simple why I use three points. Two's not enough and four is too many. <laughs> you can laugh. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, for our auger, four is not too many. He, yeah. he obviously thinks in this chapter by fours. He sees the world by fours. All right? Yes. So how he processes truth is by four things. So there are six sets of these fours. And there's one set, the fifth set of these fours that I am primarily interested in. And so without further ado, as we look together in this mystical prophetical, theological, symbolical, and numerical chapter. Let me call your attention here in Proverbs chapter number 30 to the, to the fifth of the six sets of four, beginning the reading at verse number 24. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 24. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the sun. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth, all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands, and is in the king's palace. You'll notice in verse number 24, Solomon says in this fifth of the six sets of four, this is the fifth set of four, that there are four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. I want to say to you tonight that Solomon here in this quartet, this set of fours, says two things about these four things that he mentions. And these are the two things in verse 24 that he says about the four things in verse 24 through 28. Number one, they are little upon the earth. Right. These four things are little. Number one, they are little. The second thing that Solomon says about these four things that he mentions is that they are not only little, but that they are exceeding wise. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I want to talk about these four little things that Solomon mentions here. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give you an introduction to these four little things that are exceeding wise in the remainder of our time tonight. And then tomorrow night I'm going to come back and talk about the first two of these four little things that are wise. And then Wednesday night we'll look at the last two of these four things that are little but exceeding wise. Here's my title to the study of Proverbs 30, verse 24 through 28. How to be smart. When you are small. Mm. How to be smart when you are small. Solomon is speaking, or Augur, if it be, other than Solomon, is speaking of four things that are little upon the earth. They are small. But he is careful to tell us that though they are small, little upon the earth, they're exceeding wise. They are smart, though they are small. We learn from the four things that Solomon mentions here how to be smart when we are small. Now, I want to just give a word of personal testimony, if I might, for a minute. And my brother is here tonight who can verify the validity and veracity of my own personal testimony. And my testimony is this, that almost 39 years ago, God saved me in a small country church. My first experiences with God was in a small country church. Yes, sir. My first experience with the Bible was in a small country church. Am I telling it right, brother? And nearly 39 years ago in just a small country church with a handful of people in that church, God worked effectually in my heart and saved me from my sin. Amen. I became a member of that small country church where God saved me. I was baptized into that church through believer's baptism. And when I was 19 years old, several years after God saved me as a 19-year-old boy, I knew that God... While I was in that small country church, God had been calling me to preach. When I was 19 years old, I surrendered my life in that small country church to that call of God to preach His Word. That small country church licensed me to preach, ordained me to preach, and sent me out to preach. And do you know where I've been preaching and what I've been preaching in ever since? Small country churches. Amen. I go all over America and sometimes even in other countries meet preaching in small country churches. Now, occasionally I will go preach in some city church and occasionally I'll preach in some great big city church. Well, my wife will tell you, and it is her personal testimony as well, that she was saved in a small country church until she joined my small country church. They sent us out of that small country church to where I started pastoring 32 years ago, another small country church, until I went back to the first country church where God saved me, and they sent me out again to another small country church that I've been pastoring now for nearly 27 years. And my wife will tell you that when we go to big city churches, Got some big city crowds that we are out of our element. I do preach in some, and I'm not against them. I don't, I don't have any ill feelings or hard feelings against them whatsoever. But every time we go preach in a big city church with some big congregation, my wife always says, I don't feel comfortable here. Mm. I just feel like we belong in small country churches. Yes, sir. Amen, brother. 
I want to tell you something tonight. It ain't nothing wrong with being a small country church. Yeah, man. That's right. Not only do I love small country churches, I come to tell you tonight, God loves small country yes, churches. Thank God. And works in and through and out of small country yes, churches. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen, brother. We have a mentality that bigger is always better. <laughs> and that God is into the big things. And if we ain't big, if we ain't big, then God must not be in it and something is wrong God with us. And when we develop those kinds of mentalities, we go around as small country churches feeling like terrible, horrible failures. Mm. Beating ourselves up, wringing our hands with many sleepless nights, just yeah. trying to figure out what in the world we're doing wrong. Well, you're telling it now. So I want to encourage this church, and I'm not trying to insult you. I take this to be a small country church. Yes, sir. And I want to try to encourage you in these three nights that we have together that there ain't nothing wrong with that. Don't take it for granted. Amen. That God works in and through and out of small country churches. And it's possible for a small country church to be smart, to be exceeding wise, even when we are small. Amen. All right, so I want to close tonight by giving you three simple things by way of introduction. What we learn here in verse 24 through 28 about these four little things that are exceeding wise. Number one, I want to say something tonight about these small or these little pests. There are four little pests that are exceeding wise. <laughs> Notice that, that again, Augur is using symbolic language and he is taking something that we know and understand in these four things. Notice again what they are. Number one, he mentions the ant. Yep. What is an ant tonight? That is an insect. It is a pest. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Number two, we have the, the coney. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. The coney, unlike the other three of these four little things, is not an insect. The coney is a rodent. Yeah. Something cross between a rat and a rabbit. It is a rodent. Like the other three things that are insects mentioned here, the coney is a pest. In case you were wondering, perhaps some of you were thinking when we first read this a moment ago, conies, I like that. We'll go to Sonic when the service is over. <laughs> yeah. Not that kind of coney, all right? Yeah. You have the ant, and then you have the coney. One is an insect, the other is a rodent. Both of them are little pests. They are pests. Notice number three, the locusts. Wow. Yeah. We know a little something about that right now with a cicada coming out and screaming and hollering. I didn't notice it when I got out. I wasn't paying attention. Are they screaming and hollering here like they are in the woods around my house? Not yet. Not yet. No. Well, we got them over at the edge of Mississippi and Alabama <laughs> where I live. These locusts. And again, we're dealing with insects. We're dealing with some little pests. And then, of course, the last one, spiders. Does that need any explanation tonight? <laughs> Another pest. Right. Number one, Augur is dealing here with four small pests, but though they are just four small pests, Solomon said, now they're real smart. Right. Don't think just because they are pests, because we are dealing with insects and rodents, that therefore they must be dumb. Mm. They may be small, Augur says, but they're not stupid. <laughs> they're small, but they are very smart. Four small pests. Number two, I want you to notice here in verse 24 through 28 that Augur is not only dealing with four small pests, but he's dealing with four small people. Small people, little people. Remember how I pointed out at the beginning of the chapter that he is using symbolism and metaphors 
symbolic language throughout the chapter. Sure. Notice what he says about the ants in verse 25. The ants are a people. Mm. Hmm, that gives us an indication that that Alder is not just giving us a little lesson here in entomology, the study of insects, yeah. and zoology, the study of rodents, but he is using them symbolically and metaphorically to speak about people who are like these pests. Yeah. Mm. The ants are a people. That's the thing about ants. They ain't people. They're insects. Right. They obviously, in Augur's thinking here, represent people. These past represent people. Mm. Look what he says about the coney. They are but a feeble folk using more people language. They are people. They are folks. In other words, he is using these four small pests, little pests, to talk about little people. Good. The past are symbolic of people. God loves little people. Yes, sir. Little people can learn some things from little past tonight. Mm -hmm. And there is something humbling to all of our hearts for the writer, Augur, or Solomon, whoever it may be, for him to compare us, people, you and I, human beings, to these past insects and rodents. There's something very mm. humbling about it. Yes, sir. Mm. In other words, Augur says to us people, you can, you can learn some things about being wise if you would pay attention and learn some things from the ants. They can teach us something about ourselves. Mm. Why, if you pay attention to the coney and to the locust and to the spider, if you would be humble enough to see yourself and these little things, they could teach you a thing or two about wisdom. That's what Augur says. He's talking not just about little pests, but about little people tonight. Mm -hmm. Little people. That's what I am. Right. Just one of God's little people. Just one of God's little preachers. Yes. Do we have any big shots? Do we have any big people in here? Oh, no. Hmm. Well, of course, it seems like every church has people in it that think they're big, that think they're big shots. Mm. What the writer is doing here in... Proverbs chapter number 30 is humbling us to see that we are not near as big and as important as we think we are, but we are much smaller in God's eyes. And if we could see ourselves through our own eyes as God does through His eyes, we would have a proper perspective of ourselves. Mm. God help us. Little people. Is it not the story of God through the Bible that he interacts with and uses little people? <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. Some churches think, you know, well, if we could get some big preacher, some big name preacher down here to preach for us, or if we could get some big singers. I mean, yep. them folks with them big names that can draw a crowd. Surely God would do something if we could just get uh, people, just, just big enough people with, that, that have enough importance and influence to, to, really, to really make God move on this thing and do yeah. something for Go ahead. us. It's not the history of the Bible that God doesn't work through big people. Right. God does His work through little people. Yes. Little, Ooh. helpless people. Thank God. Mm. It comes to Abraham when Abraham was an old man. <laughs> And according to Romans chapter 4, not only was Abraham an old man, but he was impotent when yeah. God came to him. <laughs> the book of Romans said he is as good as dead. That was talking about his reproductive powers. And God come to him and said, I'm going to make you a great nation. <laughs> I'm going to give you seed. I'm going to give, I'm going, I, you are going to reproduce a seed, a nation of people. 
that are going to be in number like the stars in the heaven and the sands on uh, the seashores around the earth. Yes. And what does God do? He gets, he gets a barren old man who's married <laughs> to a barren old woman <laughs> and says, now here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it through you. All right. When Israel had been captive in Egypt for 400 years as slaves, God uses a little baby in an ark in the Nile River. Just a little baby Moses. Just a baby. What's God going to use to turn this thing around? Wow. 400 years of slavery and oppression. How is God, how in the world is God going to save them from that little baby? Wow. And a little bitty boat in the Nile River. That's how he's going to do it. Mm. When Goliath is screaming out his tongues for 40 days and 40 nights, oh the giant of a big man, send me out a man that we may fight. Yeah. Who is it that God sends out? Little teenage <laughs> David with such meager, such meager weapons of the sling and the stones. God uses little people. Mm, mm, mm. When God Himself descends and becomes a man, the Holy Ghost implants a seed, just a seed. Are you listening? Just a seed in a virgin's womb. Shh. <laughs> I'm talking about little things. I'm talking about little people. Are you listening to me? Tonight? Yes, sir. God help us be little. And our Lord Jesus Christ starts his church and says, On this rock I'll build my church. He starts it with 12 men. Yep. He takes those 12 men. He goes around preaching all over the entire country. And even into, I know that we've all read in books that Jesus never left his own country of Israel, but we see him going into Tyre and Sidon and preaching. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> He's got this little church of 12 men and every once in a while he gets a big crowd that comes and hears him preach. Yeah. Not because they want to hear him preach, they don't care about his preaching because they heard he can do miracles and they like shows. Right, absolutely. You want a big church, you know, you just put out, you just have, you have enough shows, people will come, but now if you start preaching. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. You could turn, Jesus could turn a mega church into a mini church in one sermon. He did it several times. In one sermon. Yep. Look at the 12 men he has and says, hey, y'all want to go too? Yes, what he asked. Jesus, you only got 12. You better, you better be encouraging these 12. You better not give them an out. You better tell them, y'all, you know, you're all I got. Y'all got to stay. And Jesus looks at them and says, look, if y'all want to go with the rest of them, it's a, it's, this is getting out of time if that's what you want to do. I believe y'all have it up here on the wall. Jesus referring to his congregation as his little flock. That is his, what What kind of flock did he have? A little flock. You think Jesus cares about little flocks and little churches and little people like you and me? You better believe he does. You can be sure of this. Anytime in the Bible that God ever did anything big, he started with something real small. Oh, my soul. <laughs> God don't do nothing big in which he starts with something big because if he did, what he started with will get the glory for the big thing That's he does. Exactly God right. only does big things by using little and small things to do it. He ain't never going to do nothing big unless he's using something small. So everybody know that was God that did that. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir, brother. Mm. Mm. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters, before I give you my last thing and close tonight. God can use any one of us here if we're small enough. Yes. God make us small. I've had preachers ask me all through the year, what, what, do I, what do I got to do and what do I got to be for God to use me? I always tell them, you've got to be small enough. Yep. 
You're thinking too big. You want to be big. That's what you want. I can tell in the question you're asking. How do you make it big? How do you know? How, how do you get? How do you get? Only way you'll ever get. You'll have to get small. Oh God help us. You can't be too big for God to use you. You cannot be too small for God to use you. Amen, brother. When God chose Saul to be the first king of Israel, He chose Saul to be the first king of Israel because here is His stated reason, because Saul was little in his own eyes. Though Saul was bigger, head and shoulders bigger than anybody else in Israel, according to 1 Samuel. Saul did not see himself big and head and shoulders above everybody else. He saw everybody else's head and shoulders above himself. He saw himself as small. He saw himself as a little man. When he became king, he became proud and got big in his own eyes. Yeah. And Samuel told him, God has rejected you from being the king. Yes, he chose you because you were little in your own eyes. And now that you have gotten big in your own eyes, he has rejected you and has chosen another man who was David who was little in his own eyes. Reminds me of another Saul in the Bible. Oh, yeah. It's interesting when you compare the Saul in the Old Testament to the Saul in the New Testament that there are striking and remarkable similarities, both of them being from the tribe of Benjamin. Hmm. You, know that. you remember that when God appeared, when God met Saul of Tarshish on the road to Damascus, when the Lord Jesus Christ knocked him off of oh, his yes. high horse and put him on his face in the dirt. Saul asked the Lord, Who art thou? And he said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. To which Saul said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's it. And it's not many chapters later, from Acts 9 to Acts number 13, somewhere thereabout, where old Saul gets a name change. And what do we know him as today? Paul. Do you know what the name Paul means? It means little man. <laughs> if you're not careful, you'll be like the Saul in the Old Testament. And you'll start off small and end up big. And God will reject you. Mm. Or you can be like the Saul in the New Testament, start out big like we all are and get knocked by Holy Ghost conviction off your high horse down on your face and become small, become a Paul, a little man and a little woman that God can use and touch a whole world. Amen. Now here's the last thing that I'll be doing. I want you to think with me in these verses, not only about these little pests, these four little pests, and how that Augur is likening them to little people. We can learn some things about humility. But I want to say something not only about these little paths and little people, but these little places. And you will notice that uh, in at least a couple of these instances here in verse 28 through, uh, or verse 24 through 28, he mentions some of these places where they are, little places. Mm -hmm. The conies hide in the rocks and the locusts. They travel in the bands and the spider is in the king's palace. Obviously, these little pests, representing little people, occupy very little places. Very little places. In the case of the Coney, they are in very hidden places where you don't even see them. Hmm. That spider's gonna, gonna make her nest some, in some little obscure corner so as not to be detected. These little places. I want to encourage you tonight. You, you'll be smart when you're small if you realize that God uses little people and that God uses little places. Yes. Little places. I'm in a lot of churches that think, you know, boy, if we were just if we just had a better location. Mm. You know, we're we're out here, you know, and not many people travel up and down this highway and 
It's just basically people live around here, and maybe if we can get up on, you know, maybe we can get up on the interstate out here, you know, and get us a property and a building out there and get more visibility. And, you know, if we, we just had better, if we just had, you know, you know, real estate, you know, churches like real estate, location, 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 you know, we just, you know, we just, we just not in a good place. A lot of churches think that. But I am amazed in looking at the Bible how God chose to use just, just little places to get His work done. <laughs> in fact, when God left His throne in heaven to come down into this world and become a man, here's what Micah chapter 5 verse number 2 said, that He came and was born in Bethlehem of Ephrath. that Micah described as being little among the thousands of Israel. That's what it says. <laughs> Micah said now when he comes, when he comes, he ain't, he ain't, he ain't, he ain't coming to Jerusalem. Oh, wow. Now listen to when, when he comes, Ooh. he's not coming to Shiloh. <laughs> oh my soul. I got that when when he comes, when he comes. He's coming to Bethlehem. And Micah said it is little. little among all the thousands of towns and villages in Israel. Mm. It's a little bitty. My, my, my. You'll find him showing up in places like Bethlehem. That's where he's born in Bethlehem, but you know that's not where he grew up. Where'd he grow up? He grew up in Nazareth. Nazareth was so small, so obscure. <laughs> that when they are told that Jesus is from Nazareth, one of his own disciples, before yeah. he becomes a disciple, said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? They know nothing good. Because ain't good nothing God never God. good ever come well, out of some Nazareth. Good Nazareth. There's no way the Messiah could come from Nazareth. Shh. <laughs> In fact, Nazareth Ooh. was so small and obscure, it is not found on any ancient maps of the Holy Land. You can certainly find it on the map today because Jesus put it on the map. Yeah. Mm. But there ain't no references to Nazareth anywhere in the Old Testament Scriptures. Nor is it found on any of the ancient maps mm. of the Holy Land. That's how little and obscure it was. But that was where he was raised and that's where he went to church in the synagogue of Nazareth. You know, you couldn't have a synagogue unless you had at least ten men. That's probably about how many they had in Jesus' church that he grew up in. Ten men. Mm. Y'all out there tonight? Oh, yeah. Jesus loves places like Cornerstone Baptist Church, River Hill yes, Baptist Church. Are you listening to me tonight? Yes, sir. That's where I pastor, in case you was wondering. Well, you know, they really got it going on at the church in town, you know, and everybody likes going down there, and, you know, and. Well, don't just assume because that's where everybody likes to go, that that's where Jesus likes to go. Oh, my soul. Boy, ain't some, that's some preaching there. Mm. If you look for him, you, 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 it might just surprise you how he'll show up in meetings just like us right here. Sure. Places just like us right here yes. wanting to meet with him. Yes. In fact, I remember him saying in Matthew chapter number 18 about verse number 20 where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst with them. Yes, Apparently God likes them little get-togethers. Sure. Amen, brother. It just <laughs> takes two or three. You believe that tonight? Sure. Yes, sir. This is my conclusion, and we'll come back and be a little more specific. We'll talk about the ants and the conies and Wednesday night, the locusts and the spiders and exactly the things he's 
teaching us so that we can be smart, wise, even though we're small, little. That's something that stirred my heart recently is how often Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven and or the kingdom of God. It dominated Jesus' preaching and teaching. Yes. The kingdom, the kingdom. Or you can be in a Baptist church all your life never even hear a sermon about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus preached talk about it a lot. And when he would describe what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is, he did so in parabolic language, much like Augur is doing here, comparing it to something you know and understand. I want to ask you all questions. Everybody listen and I'll be done. It's just 8 o'clock, so we've, we've got our hour in. I think there was one night last year we, we finished at like 7.55. I said, that's a sin. If you don't go to church for at least an hour, <laughs> that's a sin. Amen. So we made our hour. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And I'm done. But I want to ask you a question before I turn it over to pass. The kingdom of God. What pops into your mind when I say the kingdom of God? Little child. Probably the same thing that popped in the disciples' mind when Jesus kept talking to them and teaching them about the kingdom. Oh, the kingdom of God. Probably thought, probably thought in terms of this massive palace or temple. Probably thought about this gigantic throne that Jesus was going to set on. Probably, probably thought about this kingdom of God being this massive court where they are, are his, where they are his ambassadors. They're thinking about a massive army. They're thinking, they're thinking about a universal and a global kingdom that stretches all over the, the kingdom of God. You know what Jesus kept saying? He said this at least four times in four parables. He, t he said, I'll tell you what it's like. It's like a seed. Yes, sir. And one of them, he said, it's like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds. That's what it's like. My, my, my. Your pastor mentioned it in Matthew 18. He said, I'll tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. He said, a little child. He said, a little child. And so I tell you what he said. He said, it's like, this, it's like this little toddler. That's what the word child means. It's like this little toddler right here. Yeah. That's what it's like. That's the kingdom of God. You'll have to become like that if you want to end on it. That's what he's saying. Hmm. May God give us the grace of humility. May God yes, give to God. me the grace of humility mm. to see my own smallness that I might be able to see something of his bigness in my life. Yes. God loves little churches and little people. Talks about them so much. Mm. Augur devotes one of his six sets of four to talking about and giving some attention to these <laughs> little things. May God give us wisdom to learn from them. Let's stand together for prayer and pastor you can